Hello and welcome to the Go For Mentor Winery Chat Show. This is episode 8 and uh, we've covered a lot of things. Today we're going to talk about joy of blending. Now as most of you know, uh, the format of the show, I spend a few minutes pontificating about something to do with wine, a book you should read or something interesting and then gives people a little chance to uh, get up to speed with the show. Then we go to our main topic. Uh, we're no longer live on YouTube, so any questions, any comments, um, send me an email, uh, send me a text message, we will get back to you. You will get the numbers at the end of the screen. So let's start. Um, today I don't really have a book for you. I am going to talk about blending. And as you will understand, to do blending, you have to know how to taste. Because blending is totally a sensory experience. There's no real uh, numbers here to tell you what to do. So you really need to get some education as a sommelier. You really need to take a course. You need to uh, do some tasting. You need to understand the language of wine tasting. So my wife and I have both taken this course at WSET. And it is really an incredibly useful course. You can do it online, except you have to go into New York or wherever else they have their testing centers to take the exam to get your certificate. Now they have a level two, uh, I can do have a level one, but level one is ridiculous. That's for basically consumers. Uh, level two teaches you a lot about wine tasting. They make you buy certain wines and taste them and then write in your comments, take part in a class and so forth online. Um, it takes about three months, it's a very useful course. And then my wife has done the level three, which takes about almost two years. And that's much more complex, um, goes into much more detail about wine tasting. So really, if you want to be good at blending, you really need to be good at tasting. So with that, let's start our show for today. We're going to talk about the joy of blending. As you know, uh, we talk about things that involve the Gulf Mentor in some ways, some more general topics, but just remember, we're all coming here from the wine innovation capital of the world, Far Hills, New Jersey. So why blend? We need to blend to improve flavor, aroma, mouthfeel, make a consistent product. It's a misconception that a pure varietal wine is a better wine. In fact, as I will show you, pretty much all wines are blended. Historically, wines never referenced varietals. For example, the Burgundy was a regional blend of Pinot Noir from a certain region in France, and nobody ever cared what the makeup of that Burgundy was. Uh, in fact, there's certain white grapes are added in, all kinds of shenanigans are done to make a certain flavor profile, which is what was important. Chardonnay de Pop is kind of an extreme example. Uh, it's an official blend of 13, but apparently sometimes even 20 different wines are used to make a Chardonnay de Pop. So really the old world wines are region specific blends. They have a history of what was grown in a particular area, how it's grown, the taste of that area. The whole use of uh, varietals in labeling started in the 1970s. It was invented by the UC Davis folks and the idea there was to differentiate between the Amer New World wines and the Old World wines. There was a big controversy about American winemakers calling their wine Burgundy style or Chablis, and this got the French very pissed off because they thought these were very specific names uh, for their wines. So in order to get around this, they decided to use the varietal as a way to reference wines. So instead of saying Burgundy style, it became a Pinot Noir and so forth. So it gave the U.S. wines an identity that was not regional. So you could have a Pinot Noir made in Oregon, you could have a Pinot Noir made in uh, California. It also was done by Davis to encourage the use of new varietals, so that people would actually grow these varietals and highlight these varietals. Blending wine does not make it a second-class citizen. Blending is important to get the best quality. And I'm sure you know that all, even varietals are always blended. The government regulations are, to be labeled as a varietal, it only has to have 75% of that grape. For example, you buy a Napa Cabernet Sauvignon, it only has to contain 75% of Napa Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. The other 25 can be anything. 
They could put uh, Grenache in there, Merlot, whatever they feel like. And importantly, they don't have to disclose it. The government only requires you to disclose the formula if you're putting something that's not a grape. But if you're making a blend of grape wines, you don't need to tell them what that is. So really everybody selling almost every wine, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, are all adjusting it with other grape varieties. What I'm not going to talk about today is additives. We have a policy here that we make our wine, even though it's made in very innovative, ultra-modern equipment, it's made in an artisanal style. It only involves wine, grapes, and yeast. We don't do additives. We don't add sulfites, oak powders, PVPP, acids, and so forth. So I'm not going to talk about additives because I really don't know anything about additives. I'm only going to talk about blending made wine. So first of all, some tasting tips that you have to do, because remember, you have to taste. If you can't taste and understand what you're tasting, you can't blend. So first of all, morning is best. For, for many reasons, I mean, you're more uh, sensory aware. Also, no brushing. Toothpaste contains a compound called sodium lauryl sulfate, and it affects your mouth. You cannot taste things properly. Same thing goes for coffee. No coffee. And obviously, no garlic donut, no bagel, no, no strong, odorous compound, because you really want to preserve your palate for the work it has to do. Next, you have to taste the individual components. You know, people think that blending is very complicated because how do you take seven wines and mix them up and make something? Well, it's like a, it's like a painting, right? You don't take seven colors and just mix them together at random to make a particular color. You know that you need more yellowness, or you need more green, you need more red. So the same way, you have to first categorize your component wines as to their characteristics. And we will show you how this is done. And then you can realize how to blend. You need a little more acidity, so you add the acidic component in and so forth. Then you make these blends, write down the recipes. Key to it, after a morning of tasting, either you cannot taste anything anymore, or you passed out like this poor fellow at the bottom of my slide, uh, it's hard work, believe it or not. So you need to write down what you're doing, and then a day or two later, make that blend again and see if you still like it. Because maybe your palate got so confused that you basically couldn't taste anything anymore. So, we're gonna do a little segue. How to make an award-making wine. First of all, you have to learn to taste. We discussed that. Take a sommelier class. Educate your palate. Taste wine, make notes. Very, very important. Make notes so you understand what is what. Then, if you're going to make a good blend, you need to have a lot of components. So you've got to make a palette. You've got to make, instead of having just one, uh, taking five tons of Cabernet Sauvignon and making one batch, break it up into five one-ton lots. Do each one with a different yeast, different temperatures, different uh, nutrients, okay? And you'll have now a number of different wines that are all subtly and sometimes quite distinctively different. So now you have something to play with. You can't blend if they're all the same. And you know, I'll give a plug for my equipment because after all, they're the sponsor of the show, Go Fermenter. One of the nice things with the Go Fermenter is it lets you run small lots very easily. So instead of having to do a five ton run, you can do five one ton runs without really much more effort. Take the grapes, put them out, run them all simultaneously, different yeast, different temperatures. We do this all the time. And now you have five different wines you can play with. So you have something to blend with. Very, very important and very useful and easy to do with the go fermenter. Then you have to learn to blend. You're going to make an award-winning wine. Our winery has won, I think, uh, 40 or 50 medals, including at least 10 in San Francisco for our wines. And they're really about learning to blend. Smell, taste, take notes, try blending. It's a practice thing. So blending step one. First of all, you, as I said, you've got to figure out what you're starting with. This is typical of our tasting room somewhere around March. We'll pull out all the wines that have been racking away from the season and lay them out here. And you can see it's a whole line of beakers and glasses and labels. And we start to taste each one and make notes about the characteristics of each one. And this is kind of what you have to do. When you go to a sommelier class, 
they will teach you two things. One, they'll teach you kind of a way to categorize things. So let's say you have these eight categories, sweetness, acidity, tannin, body, nose, whether it's fruity, spicy, oaky, texture, finish. And so this will allow you to make a note on each of your wines. How does it rate in these categories? Now, if you get more formal, you can use this thing you see over there called a wine wheel. It was invented by the UC Davis professor, and it basically is a formal way of characterizing flavors. Vegetal, citrus, um, and this is very important because the problem is that we are trying to describe something so that somebody else can understand. So if you say it tastes like licorice, well, somebody else may not understand what that means. Uh, we had a funny incident in, in Spain some years ago. We took some of our wines and uh, somebody said it was balsamic. Now, balsamic to us meant uh, horrible. It, 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 it vegetal, hor but no, balsamic meant a kind of a uh, tannic uh, finish. So. Uh, there's a formality to this, and that's one reason why you must go to a wine course so you learn how to describe your wine in a very formalistic way. It's a bit like law, you know, the, the words mean everything. For example, it will say uh, grassy notes. Well, obviously there's no grass in the wine. Although I do recall one time uh, we were doing a wine tasting to a rather unsophisticated audience, and uh, I described, my wife actually was doing the, uh, the tasting, she said, there's a notes of chocolate. And somebody came up and said, well, do you add chocolate to your wine? And you know, so there is that. So, but it's really just so that you and I and everybody else can understand, communicate, what does it taste like? The second step in blending is, what are you making? If you're making a specific arrival, so you're making a Cabernet Franc, okay? Remember, first of all, the 75% rule. It has to be 75% Cabernet Franc to legally be a, labeled as a Cabernet Franc. But more importantly, it should taste like a Cabernet Franc. So you're making this particular adjustment, be careful you don't stray from the Cabernet Francness of your wine, because then you will fail in the awards, because it won't taste like a Cabernet Franc. It may taste delicious, but it won't be a Cabernet Franc. So that's very important. You gotta know your goal. Second point you might have is to match a specific blend. For example, we make something called Black River Red. It's a concoction of Fauche, believe it or not, uh, Petit Syrah, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and it's, it's a very interesting wine. It's marketed as a blend because it, the Fauche content, which is a predominant grape here, is less than about 60-65%. Now, our idea here is to match the previous year's vintage so that people have a consistent blend. They expect a certain taste from this red, Black River Red, and we want to give them the same feeling. It's like blended whiskey. It should always taste the same. Johnny Walker always tastes the same. That's the whole point of it. So here, your objective is to adjust your blending to get the same result as you got last year, in spite of variations in the grape year to year. Then you might be doing an artisanal thing. You want to make a Rhone style. You want to make a Chardonnay de Pop. Again, you're going to make a blend. But you don't have one predominant grape, but you're looking for a certain flavor overall profile. The third thing, of course, is you're making a brand new blend. You want to make something with Chambres and something. So you're making a brand new blend, and now you actually have much more flexibility. The third stage is how do you make these blends? Again, we know that we have one that's acidic, one that's tannic, and the process is very tedious. You take samples, you, you uh, measure out you know, 40 milliliters of this and 10 milliliters of that. You mix it all together with your pipe pad and everything else and then taste it. And you say, okay, well this one needs more body. So you think to yourself, what in my collection of wines do I have that's got a lot of body? So you pick that one and edit it. Remember I said, it's not a random event. You're basically painting here and you've got to sh make sure you're picking the right colors in order to get where you want. Now it's very tedious to make these blends. I mentioned you gotta uh, measure out each component, you gotta keep track of the recipe. It's very hard to make small variations. Say you put 10% Merlot in with the Cabernet Sauvignon. Now you wanna try 15% Merlot and 85% Cabernet Sauvignon. So you gotta make another whole batch with the graduates and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's also hard to make the same blend again. You made something, you liked it, and you like to make another batch of it to see how it tastes, it's really good. So you know how I am, I'm a very lazy person. In fact, we used to be called the lazy winemakers. Uh, we are still lazy winemakers. So I said, there had to be a better way of doing this. 
So I uh, work, made an automated blending machine. And what it does is you have up to four uh, components. You put them in four beakers if you want. And each one has a little pump to it. And you go to the device and you tell it what you want. You want 80% of the first one, 30% of the second one, whatever the combination that you want and the total that you want. You want a glass full, you want a liter, you want a gallon, whatever you want. And you push a button and the machine basically sequences the pumps to combine the exact amount of wine. The precision flow meter is used to calculate that each volume is actually correct. And then it records a recipe for you. So if you want to go back and do it again, all you do is uh, give it the same recipe number or the percentages, hit the button and make another batch. And this has really revolutionized our blending because we can go through maybe 50, 60 combinations in an hour instead of doing five or six and all the graduates. So the next slide actually shows you this in real life. And for lack of a better name, I call it a Go Blend because we have a singular lack of imagination in our, in our naming here. It's Go Base, Go Fermenter, Go Cooler, so Go Blend. All right. So anyway, here you see it in real life. Uh, there are the four pumps up there. You see the four beakers all containing the four different components. You can have less than four, but it's, it can do up to four. And then you see in the front, there's a little uh, wine glass, and that's where it delivers your blend. There's a little touch panel with a control panel with the percentages and how much you want, and you hit the start button, and there it does it. So the next slide, or video actually, will show you how this is, looks like in, uh, in, a, in action. So I'm gonna pick my percentages of what I want and then I'm going to ask it to start the uh, operation. There we go. So you see the first pump comes on and it puts in the amount of that first component that you had selected, uh, whatever percent. Then it slows down to get a precision uh, dispense. Then it does a second pump. And soon you'll see the third pump. And finally, in this case, there were four components. We asked for all four and there's the fourth pump. And there's your blended sample ready for tasting and for uh, analysis and off you go. Then you can adjust one of these a little bit and make another blend. Super, super simple. So what have we learned today? I hope you've learned to embrace the blend. The only way to make a quality wine is to blend. You have to educate your palate. If you're a winemaker, you need to take a sommelier class. You need to know how to taste what you're making. Make lots of variations. Don't just make five tons in one pass. Make five one tons, change the yeast around, do something, make variations. And then blend, 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 and blend. There's no substitute for just trying out things and tasting them. Now, I can make you a go blend machine. If there's interest, we can make this into a product. But if you are interested in one of these, we can probably build you something and uh, give you a, a price for one. So if you want something, send me an email. So that was our episode for uh, uh, today. Uh, it's episode eight. Again, any questions, text them to this number, email me. Uh, all the old episodes are on the website. So if you want to see seven, six, and so forth, you can go on the website and look it over there. Uh, we'll be back on in two weeks. And the next topic is going to be negotiating labeling. We're going to talk about what the labels are, what they do, how the TTB works, how COLA works, how to negotiate the label um, liberant without losing your mind. It's actually quite simple once you know how to do it. Thank you so much for watching and see you in a couple of weeks.